Well, uh, thank you, Kevin, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the Austin Institute for bringing me back for my second time around. Um, yeah, so we're, we're here tonight to talk about a uh, rather grim subject matter. I'll, I'll try to find a way to make it lighter, um, hopefully shed some light on it a little bit. Uh, we are also, by coincidence, uh, eating dinner just a few blocks from where the phenomenon that we are talking about got started. Uh, the mass shooting phenomenon as it exists in modern America started in 1966. The University of Texas shooting, a man named Charles Whitman went on top of the tower and for a couple of hours with a rifle uh, was shooting innocent people down on the street. He ended up killing 15 people, uh, one of whom died actually just a few years ago, but is considered to have died as a result of his injuries. Um, there have been a num number of other, uh, what we would consider significant mass shootings um, Within an hour or two's drive of here, uh, there was the Luby's massacre up in Killeen in 1991, Fort Hood shooting a few years ago, and most recently the Sutherland Springs shooting, in which I believe 26 people were killed in a, in a church. Uh, the mass shootings problem is a particularly vexing one uh, to try to understand how to respond to and to just try to understand how to think about in conventional ways. And there are a few reasons for that. One reason is that it's easy to uh, want to diminish or minimize its significance. If you try to take account of it in terms of body count, as we inevitably have to do, uh, the FBI, which I think keeps the most reliable statistics on this, estimates that something shy of a thousand people have died in active shooter incidents uh, since the year 2000. By contrast, over that same people, uh, over that si same period, uh, more than 200,000 people have died of gun homicide in the United States. That's just homicide, that's not clowning suicide. Um, so if you think about it in those terms, this seems like a, you know, a very small part of a much larger problem, and it's often talked about in that way as part of the gun violence problem. So there's a temptation to say, and we often hear, that th this is just the smaller part of a larger problem, uh, and maybe that we're paying too much attention to it, right? Maybe we should be paying one two hundredth as much attention to mass shootings as we do to gun violence or to these other problems. Uh, and I want to say that that is not a helpful way to think about this problem, that mass shootings are horrifying and therefore we are legitimately horrified at them. And it's legitimate for us to pay a different kind of attention to them. And I'm, I'm going to argue that they really should be understood as a separate kind of phenomenon from gun violence. But it's legitimate for us to pay attention to these sensational and uh, horrific acts in the same way that we paid more attention to uh, the 9-11 attacks than we did to the larger number of people who died that year from radon exposure or rheumatoid arthritis or the like. They're, they're different in kind. Um, there's also a more pervasive problem here, which is the, the temptation to have this phenomenon get swept up in culture war narratives. Um, like almost everything else that happens in this country, um, mass shootings seem to touch on everything. They have these valences of almost every other issue that we fight about. And so it's easy to see them as connected to everything else. You may have heard that mass shootings are really a mental health problem, that they are really a gun violence problem, that they are really a problem of America's love affair with guns, that they're a problem about video games, that was one we heard in the 1990s, that they're a problem of toxic masculinity, uh, that they have something to do with whiteness or white nationalism, that they are a problem of the rot of our ruling class, that's a take that I've seen written, uh, and on and on. Um, I want to say that there is some partial truth in some of these explanations, but I think that trying to approach mass shootings in this way, again, as being part of some other larger problem, uh, causes us to miss some important things about this phenomenon um, and also causes us to talk past each other uh, about what this problem really is. And just to respond to a few of those kinds of narratives that I just offered, uh, mental illness for one. Psychology researchers have not really found a meaningful link between mass shootings and what we might call severe mental illness. So uh, when you hear this explanation, uh, often this is in the service of the idea that somebody by definition would have to be insane to commit this kind of act. Uh, and when we think of insane, uh, we think of somebody who is detached from reality, who has lost their grip on the way that the world actually is, who's maybe debilitated by delusions, schizophrenic, psychotic, something like that. Although that is true of some portion of mass shooters, it's a pretty small minority. It's probably in the single digits of percentages. Uh, so it really doesn't explain much about this phenomenon. Um, second, the narrative about uh, mass shootings just being a symptom of gun violence. Uh, 
that's also not really well supported by understanding what's going on with gun violence. Uh, for the sake of sparing everybody some uh, AV malaise, I didn't bring in charts and graphs and so forth, but you can look at the charts of this and the, the trends of mass shootings are steadily upwards over the last 20 years, basically since Columbine, both in terms of the number uh, of shootings there have been and the number of people who've been killed. Uh, again, if you look at the FBI statistics, 20 years ago it was something like one to five shootings per year. Now it's more like 25 to 30. You may have heard much more inflated statistics than that and those are, are rather bogus. I can talk about that in the Q&A. But if you look at the gun violence trends, they're going in the opposite direction. Gun violence has been going down for about 20 or 30 years. Mass shootings have been going up. So these trends are going in opposite directions. That doesn't mean that they're unrelated, but they're not strictly the same thing. Uh, also, the share of American households uh, that have guns has been going down since uh, at least the late 1970s when there are statistics on this. In 1978, 51% of households reported having a gun. Now it's 36%. So the pure availability of guns, at least in terms of share of the population, also doesn't seem to be very highly correlated. It also seems to be going in the opposite direction. Um, you also hear a lot of talk about race having something to do uh, with mass shootings. Often it's attributed to being a particularly uh, white phenomenon because a lot of mass shooters are white. Sometimes you hear that it's an Asian phenomenon because there have been some Asian mass shooters. These narratives also don't really make a lot of sense. Most mass shooters are white because most of the population is white. The racial breakdown of mass shooters is basically the same as that of the general population. Uh, mass shooters are almost exclusively male, so that part is obviously true. Um, I'd like to suggest an alternate account then of the mass shooting phenomenon. One of the common refrains that you hear uh, after these events is that they are senseless and baffling, that we can't find a motive for them, we'll never really understand the reason for them. There's a criminologist named Park Dietz who says that we talk about mass shootings as if they are uh, alien forces that they are dispatched from some place that we can't understand. And instead of this, I'd like to suggest that this feeling of bafflement and senselessness is exactly what mass shootings are about. It's what they're intended to evoke, and recognizing that gets us some way toward understanding what they really are. I'd like to propose a different model for understanding what a mass shooting is. Uh, the model is that of imitative narcissistic terrorism. I'll come back to that term in a moment. Uh, researchers who study the phenomenon, instead of being baffled by them, actually find a pretty consistent set of patterns that recurs in them. Uh, the, one of the chief patterns is that they are indiscriminate killings, where killing people is the prime aim. So in this sense, they are defined precisely by the fact that there is not a conventional motive for the perpetrator to target the specific individuals they do. They may choose individuals for being a member of a particular class, that's been more and more the case recently, but the specific individuals are not particularly targeted. Um, Sometimes you'll hear definitions of mass shootings as being an event where four or more people are killed uh, or four or more people are injured. I think this is a very bad and unhelpful definition. It's an arbitrary cutoff. It includes a lot of things that we don't really mean when we talk about a mass shooting, like gang shootings, uh, spree killings, things like that. Um, and then it fails to include uh, some of the more notorious mass shootings we know about where, in fact, the number of people who died was actually fairly low. It also fails to include um, events where shooters were stopped in time, right? Where this was a would-be mass shooter who was stopped by police uh, or by citizens. So there was just one of these uh, recently. I can't remember where this was. It was somewhere in Texas, Fort Worth, yeah. So there was a, a man who started shooting in a church and was taken down by the church's security team. That should be understood as a intended mass shooting, but it would not qualify under the, the four or more definition. So the, the FBI and Mother Jones magazine actually keep the most reliable statistics on this because they look at the motivation of the shooter and they understand somebody going into a place and just attempting to kill as many people as possible indiscriminately. That's the definition that they look for. Uh, another pattern here is that uh, perpetrators often dress in military gear or in black clothing. They've often had a lifelong fascination with weaponry. Uh, they typically either take their own lives during the act or they are killed by police uh, and usually that is itself a form of suicide. There's usually evidence that that is what they intended to happen during the act. Uh, the perpetrators, again, are generally not insane in any kind of clinical or ordinary sense of the word. They do usually suffer from what psychologists would call personality disorders, so grandiosity, resentment, self-righteousness. Uh, unlike serial killers, they don't usually have a prior history of violence, and they don't seem to be sadists in the sense that they derive pleasure from inflicting pain. They're, they don't usually have a prior history of you know, torturing animals, those kinds of precursor things that you find in serial killers. 
What they are instead is they are described as collectors of injustice who nurture a wounded narcissism. So they are narcissistic and they are also self-loathing. And they believe that the world has wronged them and they keep this growing list about ways that the world has wronged them. And they construct these stories out of this and they develop these fantasies of heroic revenge. And they're going to inflict their revenge against the world. Not, sometimes they'll start with the specific individuals they believe to have wronged them. But then they construct a story about how all of society is to blame and that's why they move on to targeting innocent people. They also are usually not impulsive. They don't usually snap. They tend to have obsessive and highly organized personalities. Uh, the ones who carry out the worst and deadliest shootings are usually the most obsessive and organized. They often methodically plan these acts for months or years beforehand. And a large part of this planning is that they often pay obsessive attention to what previous shooters did. Um, they often are found to have detailed information on the methods that were used, the weaponry, all of the kind of tactics and details, a lot of the kind of iconography, what they were wearing, all of that kind of stuff. Some of them talk about it as a competition. They say that they want to set a record. Um, and then they also very often give warning signs beforehand. It's usually the case that when you go and talk to friends and acquaintances of these mass shooters, a lot of them will say, yeah, we're not exactly surprised <laughs> that he did this. Or um, you know, maybe even somebody said, yeah, if there was anybody in our school who was going to commit a mass shooting, we said before that it was probably going to be this guy. You hear this in a lot of these cases. And sometimes they'll even say something like, I'd really like to commit a mass shooting. I'd like to kill a lot of people. Um, and these comments are kind of brushed off uh, by friends and peers. They don't know whether to take them seriously. They're not said in a direct way. People don't really know what to do when you hear something like that, right? There isn't a good means of doing something with those warning signs. Um, and of course, there's probably a large number of people who offer these kinds of warning signs and then don't go on to become shooters. Um, and then perhaps most importantly out of all of this is that they attempt to take control of the public narrative about their crime by creating manifestos and other materials that they leave behind. And they intend these to be broadcast and read widely. So I hope that it'll be clear from these patterns why I've described this as imitative narcissistic terrorism. Let me go through those three terms. It's terrorism because it resembles conventional terrorism in just about every way, except that it's usually not connected to or spurred by a larger organized group and it usually doesn't have a political purpose. The goal is simply to target, target random innocent people uh, ostensibly for the sins of society writ large. And again, the senselessness of it is the point of it. It is narcissistic because instead of having a political purpose, the purpose is usually to advance the cause of the perpetrator's own ego. So where the 9-11 hijackers wanted to advance jihad, a mass shooter is interested in advancing and glorifying himself uh, and his narrative and his sense of grandiosity. The desire for control and sometimes for personal infamy is key to their motivation. And finally, it's imitative because these acts are clearly influenced by previous acts. Uh, you know, I mentioned the obsessive attention that is sometimes paid by mass shooters to previous shooters. Now that can function at a conscious level, as I've mentioned. It can also be at, a, at an unconscious level, right? So consciously, if you're a frustrated young man and you want to take out your sense of grandiosity on the world, what you basically have is a ready-made script or a template that you can follow. This has been done so many times that you don't have to sit down and think of it. It's sort of a grisly and gruesome thing to think about this, but somebody had to think up the idea of doing this act, right? Charles Whitman was essentially one of the first ones. It didn't really catch on then, and then with Columbine was really where it caught on again. And the Columbine th uh, event has really been the template for mass shootings for the last 20 years. Um, and then this can also happen at a subconscious level. When this is just happening a lot, when it's out there, the idea can work its way into people's heads to do this. And I th my, my rough sense of this is that it happens more at a kind of subconscious level, the imitation for the, the smaller and the less well-planned uh, shootings. And by understanding mass shootings in this way, I think we can begin to see them as a distinct phenomenon. They have their own etiology. They have their own mode of perpetuating further acts of violence. They really can be understood as something that is distinct from gun violence, from a lot of these other problems. Uh, it frees us also from uh, the typical response that media often have of, after mass shootings, which is to try to get inside the shooter's head, understand the motivation, who wronged them, understand the cause, right? I think if you understand them in this way, you understand that the, that, that search is never going to yield an answer that's really going to be satisfactory, because the whole point is for it to be disproportionate to any particular uh, motive or inciting act that it might have had. It, it allows you to think of it instead as a kind of broader phenomenon and whose spread you want to stop. Um, 
So it also suggests that mass shootings bear, uh, bear, less, shooting, uh, bear less similarity, again, to general gun violence than they do to political terrorism or to other forms of contagious violence. And there are other forms of contagious violence that we can uh, look to and observe as having similarities. Um, other cultures often have uh, their own forms of this. You know, we often hear about mass shootings as a distinctly American phenomenon. There's some truth to that, some not. Um, there, are, there is such a thing as mass stabbings, uh, particularly in Asia and China. That's become a growing problem there. Uh, in Malaysia in the 19th, uh, 19th century, there was a phenomenon known as running amok, where young men with no past history of violence would pick up a sword, enter a populated area, and attempt to kill as many as people as possible before being killed or taking his own life. It was, on the surface, very similar to this. I think that the, um, the kind of spurs and motives for it were different. I don't know that there was the same personal infamy desire. Um, but in a lot of other ways, it was very similar. It was something that just kind of started out of nowhere and uh, imitated itself and spread. There's another precedent that I think is more applicable to our own culture, which is that of suicide. And mass shootings are actually usually a form of suicide. Um, the idea that people might be influenced to take their own lives by hearing about others doing it uh, goes back really it goes back to antiquity. Um, but because it's a much more widespread phenomenon, uh, there's a lot more research available on suicide. And for several decades, going back, I think, at least to the, uh, the 1940s and then uh, in a more concerted way in the 1960s, there's been fairly good systematic uh, psychological and criminological evidence for a contagion or imitation effect in suicides. Uh, a lot of this has to do with showing that after uh, prominent media events, uh, often the, this death by suicide of a prominent celebrity, there will often be a spike in the suicide rates after that. Marilyn Monroe was a famous case of this. Um, there are other examples of this as well. And this is an especially helpful example uh, because this is something that has been recognized by researchers and uh, journalists and public policy people for several decades. Um, there's an example from the city of Vienna in the 1980s they suddenly experienced a rash out of nowhere of uh, lots of people committing suicide on the subway system. And a, a group of local researchers thought that sensational media coverage might have something to do with this. And they persuaded the newspapers to uh, change their coverage. Um, sorry? Oh. Really? Yes. Uh, and what they, what they persuaded the newspapers to do was to uh, minimize details and photographs the newspapers had been reporting on this in a kind of sensational and even romanticized way, that there was a kind of tragic beauty in what these people were doing. Um, so they persuaded the newspapers to avoid covering it in that way. They moved the stories from the front page to deeper end of the newspaper. They kept the word suicide out of the headlines. And after they did this, the subway suicides dropped by about 75%. Now this kind of practice has become very gradually more widespread uh, around the world, especially in the Western world. Um, even just in the last five to ten years, you'll notice changes in the way that suicide is reported on uh, by journalists. Um, often you'll find that, um, that the fact is not put into the headline. It's usually put somewhere around the fourth paragraph of a news article. Uh, they'll be careful about reporting details on methodology because one of the findings here is that the more specific you get about the method that the person used, the more that creates ideation in other people. It kind of and not, it's not only giving them information about how to do it, but it's allowing them to visualize in their mind what doing it would actually entail. And so leaving out those details is actually crucial to uh, dampen down that contagion effect. So a number of observers, including myself, have been calling for a similar uh, approach by journalists to reporting on mass shootings for at least five to 10 years. If you look at the way that the media covered the Columbine shooting and the Virginia Tech shooting, these were essentially textbook examples of what not to do. Uh, the Columbine shootings were reported so sensationally, there was so much attention to what the shooters were wearing, their methodology, what guns they used, the manifestos and journals that they left, the security tapes of them committing the act, that this basically became, um, th these became icons, right? It became a template and it became seared in the public consciousness as this is what a mass shooting is, this is what it means, this is how you do it. Um, there was a, a kind of romanticized, um, aura about it. And the Columbine shooting in particular probably bears more responsibility than, than any others for having inspired a raft of shooting sense. Even to this day, uh, researchers, when they go look through the materials that mass shooters leave behind, um, they're often links to Columbine or to other shootings that were themselves inspired by Columbine. So the, the tentacles from that one are really kind of heinous. 
Uh, there was something similar with the Virginia Tech shooting. This was in 2007, I believe. Uh, the perpetrator left behind a video manifesto that he dropped in the mail to NBC News right before he went and started the act. NBC News aired part of this manifesto. It was just a complete disaster. It's like airing a, you know, a propaganda film out of North Korea or something like that. There's so little informational value in it. Uh, now, like suicides, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the media practices on this have actually evolved and changed over the last five to ten years. It is uh, more common now for broadcasters to avoid uh, repeating the names of perpetrators, to not air their manifestos and propaganda. Anderson Cooper and Megyn Kelly are two of the ones who early on decided to do this. A number of prominent journalists have pledged not to say perpetrators' names at all. Uh, and I think there's been a general shift on this by the rest of the media, too. There is less of this kind of hurried desire to get inside shooters' heads, to play in this game of being really fascinated by them and granting them this infamy by, by wanting to play into their narrative and really understanding what they're all about. Um, I don't know if there's been a general appreciation that there's simply not a lot of uh, knowledge to be gained by doing that or that we already know most of what we're going to from it, but there's at least a better appreciation for the risk that is posed by that. And I think that the media practices on this have changed for the better. Um, and although this is an analysis that, that I've been airing for many years and other journalists have been airing too, uh, I think that there are other important changes to the phenomenon of mass shootings that have happened over the last five or so years uh, since I first started talking about it. Uh, one change is the one that I just noted, the media practices have evolved. Another is that the nature of the media environment itself has changed. So whereas traditional mass media played a really big role in this 10 and 20 years ago, it's less obvious that they do now. Um, it's less obvious that the, that the media can kind of influence this one way or another. Social media is obviously much bigger and it's much less clear what you can really do to kind of stop the, the contagion effect there. Although the, the uh, thought minders at Twitter and Facebook are, are actually good about um, finding videos when these things happen and tamping down the spread of that early on, which is a limited case in which I'm in favor of uh, speech policing by the platforms. Um, Additionally, although my sense of this is only anecdotal, I think that the nature of the shootings themselves has actually uh, evolved over the last five years. Uh, it's, it's less clear to me that the big uh, events of the last five or so years have been motivated by the desire for infamy, for personal infamy, in the way that they were 10 and 20 years ago, in the sense that the shooter wants his own name and uh, personality and profile to become well known. Uh, I, I think that they have actually more gradually started to resemble conventional terrorism. Uh, when I first wrote about this seven years ago, I described it as apolitical terrorism. And I'm not as sure that that is true anymore. There does seem to be a growing sense of ideological uh, motive in a lot of these acts. And that's something that, that complicates the picture that I've just offered. Um, I think we also have to acknowledge that despite media practices on this evolving for the better, the problem hasn't itself really gotten any better. Uh, mass shootings continue to be on an upward trend. Uh, several of the deadliest shootings in U.S. history have happened just in the last few years in Las Vegas, Orlando, uh, Florida, Sutherland Springs. Um, and I think for better and for worse, uh, the way that people respond to them, we've, we've kind of gotten desensitized. I don't think we're as shocked by them anymore. And although that's tragic and sad, from a contagion standpoint, that's actually better because it means that it, it decreases their sort of power. Nonetheless, although these things seem to be going for the better, the phenomenon itself doesn't seem to be improving. So that leaves us with a different sort of set of questions that we may need to be asking ourselves now about how to respond to mass shootings than we did uh, five to 10 years ago. Uh, one particularly promising development to mention is the rise of what's called behavioral threat assessment, uh, the behavioral threat assessment model. These are uh, usually law enforcement teams, sometimes private security teams that are specifically aimed at monitoring and analyzing kind of warning signs that shooters give off before they carry out an act. Um, there are localities that are doing this. There's some in California, some school districts that are doing this, uh, other places that are doing this. They're basically trying to take those warning signs that are given off and have um, dedicated teams that understand them and that have some kind of rationally, systematically developed model for understanding how likely of a threat is this, how do you deal with it. Um, this approach is still in its early days. Uh, the Secret Service actually just released its own model on this a couple of years ago, but I so far haven't seen uh, much in the way of systematic evidence about what or, whether it works or not. Uh, it does seem to me to be 
the right kind of approach to take because it is targeting this as a distinct phenomenon. Um, it's not doing what's happened before, which is to lump this under uh, you know, school psychology or putting it into the police system where there are just so many false positives that it is easy for these kinds of warning signs to get uh, to slip through the cracks. I think it also has the advantage um, that usually when these things are deployed, um, they are separated enough from conventional law enforcement that the aim is to uh, try to avert uh, rather than try to uh, punish or take retribution. So that changes the incentive structures uh, around reporting, right? If you can make people feel that they, that they can hear something that they're not sure whether it's a joke or not, and they can turn it over to authorities without worrying that they might ruin this person's life, then maybe you could collect these warning signs in a more systematic way. Um, there have also been, uh, there's also been the passage of uh, what are called red flag laws, uh, which is where a person's friends or family can report to police that they think that this person may be a danger to others. And uh, a judge can issue a temporary order to take the person's guns away if they have them. This is something that uh, generally has bipartisan support. Even a lot of gun rights supporters uh, are in favor of this. Uh, it's a more specific and kind of targeted measure, and most people see it as a reasonable infringement on liberty for the sake of public safety. These are all just kinds of glimmers. Uh, they're only happening in a few places right now. And then there are the kind of conventional questions about gun control. There's active shooter drills in schools, changes to the mental health system, obviously still, still relevant to this, even if it doesn't explain everything. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll sideline discussing those. You can ask me about them if, you, if you'd like. Um, I do want to say in closing that the, the thing I've been critiquing from the outset, which is the attempt to find cultural explanations for mass shootings or to subsume them into the culture wars, uh, as problematic as that is, it also can't be entirely avoided. There's no way we can look at this and not say that this is a cultural problem or symptom of something that has gone wrong in our society. Uh, I mostly think that our, our ability to have those discussions is, uh, I, I'm not very confident in our ability to have those discussions well. Uh, but I think that that ability will be improved if we understand this as its own uh, distinct and self-perpetuating phenomenon. Uh, but the cultural critique cannot be entirely avoided. Um, so yeah, I think that's where I'd like to, to close and open up to questions.